seek impact and scale of our innovation, we often undermine the imperative value of context. When we do this, we're really taking on a few assumptions that absolutely demand to be tested. One of those is that technology is the hard part. People, they're pretty easy and they're pretty similar context to context. The second assumption is that the way it is here on my home turf is probably the way it is largely everywhere else. A third, we often can believe that the value of our prototype will be so evident to people and institutions around the world, including in our backyard, that when it comes to moving beyond prototype, the work of scale and uptake, everyone will get it and they'll come in to help us do this. And fourth, the idea that context itself is static. If we can take a picture once, we're largely okay, when in fact, context is dynamic. So it doesn't matter whether you're in Kenya or the United States. The question is, how do you take your perspective from the institution that you call home and how do you open up a vastly wider lens to really appreciate and contend with all of the complexities of a place that is not your own? Well, there's some tools and some frameworks that can help us do that. We can think about context analysis as having four dominant features. The first feature is the enabling environment. Think about the backdrop against which innovation occurs, the political and legal aspects, cultural, religious, gender, infrastructure. Think about the market and the business conditions that shape that environment in which innovation occurs. Actors and inputs constitute a second dimension. For inputs, think about technologies. What are the technologies at play? Actors might include users who could be separate from customers, institutions such as your ministries of health, or bodies like a community health worker organization or a group of farmers organized in a farming cooperative. Interactions constitutes a third dimension. So by interactions within a given context, how do the actors relate? Think about private sector, academia, government. How do those actors come together? Why do they do so? Around what agendas? At what periodicity? And then how do those actors relate to their enabling environment? Outputs and outcomes constitutes the fourth dimension. So the outputs and outcomes of a given context can include not just the products, but novel processes that innovators bring to bear, as well as such social outcomes as wealth, health, or well-being. We can consider those four dimensions as having relevance at a number of scales. So imagine looking through the prism of the challenge you seek to solve. Think about how that challenge plays out at at least three levels. At the most micro, that's the level of the individual, what does the enabling environment, inputs and actors, interactions, outputs, outcomes, what does it mean at the level of the individual? More broadly, think about institutions. Within whole institutions, what do you need to know to understand not only the likelihood of an innovation being a success, but the context in which scaling that innovation is likely to occur? And at the most broad level, at the level of a whole nation, a whole country, what does it mean for you, the innovator, and for the beneficiaries whose lives you seek to improve? We can look at a singular example Let's go to Uganda and boosting the health of children through nutritional supplements. We can take a single example from the nutrition space and kind of walk through those three layers and see what an inspection of those four dimensions could reveal to us by doing so. Let's think first at that most macro perspective, which is the national context level. And let's go to our first dimension. So that's enabling environment. So a dimension of the enabling environment that might really have bearing on the likelihood of your innovation going to scale is the fact that Uganda is a landlocked country. What does that mean for infrastructure and the infrastructure constraints that are going to pose challenges in terms of the distribution of your innovation? 
That second dimension around actors and the agents inside of the system in which you seek to have an impact, you could think about institutions such as those that relate to standards, testing, monitoring, quality control. Uganda has the National Bureau of Standards. So what does the Uganda National Bureau of Standards role? What is it in terms of certifying your product and assuring that it is market ready? In terms of interactions, what are the relationships between the creation of new knowledge on new products, nutritional supplements for children, and the manner in which that knowledge translates into frontline community health workers? How does that interaction occur, and what does it mean for the viability of your attempt to introduce a new product into the market? And then when it comes to outputs and outcomes, we could pose a question around the impact of nutrition on Ugandan children's mental and physical well-being. And what is the cost to society in terms of that burden? So at the national level, we know that there are a host of institutions that have relevance in terms of taking our innovation to scale. Let's think about the Ministry of Health. So within the Ministry of Health, what do we need to ask or think about when it comes to the enabling environment and the Ministry of Health? What is the Ministry of Health's role in terms of responding to policy as it relates to research, nutrition, children, mothers, etc.? When it comes to actors and inputs, we can ask who are the people inside of the Ministry of Health with functional authority over decision-making on nutritional supplements? When it comes to interactions, you could ask a number of really important questions. For example, how does the Ministry of Health relate to the village health centers, hospitals, and the range of delivery agents that might come from the NGO community, the donor community, etc.? To the fourth dimension, outputs and outcomes, from the perspective of the Ministry of Health itself, how does the Ministry of Health quantify health outcomes when it comes to children's nutrition? Are they quantifying the percentage of children that are iron deficient? Are they looking at low birth rate? How they measure success relates to how you propose your value proposition and how you deliver it. So within the country context, we have that institutional context, but we can drill down even further to the level of the individual. So at the level of the individual, we can think about that first dimension, enabling environment. So think about how the voices of policy and culture, how those external influences shape and influence the decision-making of a single Ugandan mother in terms of the choices she confronts around the nutrition for her child. Then we can think about actors and inputs. When it comes to decision-making for income at the level of the household, is it a husband? Is it a religious group? Is it the voice of government, some other policy constraint, et cetera? Which actors shape her worldview and her decision-making? Then at the level of interactions, let's think about all of the steps a Ugandan mother must take if she were to access a new optional nutritional supplement for her child. And what are the true costs in terms of transport, opportunity cost, time that she's not performing labor, etc., that she would have to confront all of those interactions if she were to take on the opportunity to purchase, let's say, this nutritional supplement. And finally, in terms of outcomes and outputs at the level of a singular Ugandan mother, what in fact are the true costs that she bears as opposed to the proposed benefits of this new innovation? The advantages of clarifying context are four. If we pull this off, we stand to benefit from the following. One, we measure risks. And when we measure risks, we set ourselves up to confront them. Two, we allow ourselves to very explicitly test assumptions, assumptions that underpin how we make a relationship with people, institutions, and whole communities outside of our own. Three, this critical examination of context allows us, it really invites us to build relationships differently, maybe with different entities, different actors, different institutions than we would have otherwise recognized in absence of context analysis. And finally, we can secure resources now very explicitly because our context analysis enables us to see how very worthwhile doing so would be. 
So in short, by taking this approach, really we have some tools and some frameworks that can change the way we innovate in powerful ways. 